blood for Bible study on tonight. We pray that you will share this video with your family and friends. I received a text message today from Dolores Sadler from Holy Trinity Baptist Church. And it says, remember Humpty Dumpty? He had a great fall. And all the kings, horses, and men could put him back together again. He, Humpty Dumpty, did have the right key. Whenever we're broken, for whatever reason, our king of kings is able to put us back together. Be it illness, relationships, circumstances, situations, anything and everything, our king of kings can put us back together again. Thank God that we have the right king. The king that we serve, the king of kings, he is a powerful king. He is so powerful that there is power in just the name of Jesus. There is healing in his name. There is um, deliverance in his name. And I am just so glad that I know Jesus. In the name of Jesus the Christ, we come. God, we thank you for another privilege, another honor, another opportunity to come before you. God, we thank you for this, again, a privilege of prayer. God, we thank you for blessing us and keeping us. We thank you for wrapping you up around us and blessing us, Father God. God, we say hallowed to your name. God, we glorify you. We magnify you. Father, we make you big before mankind. God, we thank you for another privilege, Father God, just to lift up your name. Father, there is no God like you. You are the only great and true God. Father, there is no God who does what you do. You are the only one who can do what you do, Father God. God, there is no God like you, Father God, who keeps us, saves us, moves in our lives, and magnifies us, Father God, that we will magnify you. 
Now, Lord, we ask you, Father God, to bless us as we come and study your word. We ask you to forgive us for our sins, forgive us for messing up, forgive us for falling short, forgive us, Lord, for missing the mark. Now, Lord, we ask you, Father God, to continue to walk with us. Bless us tonight that you will be real to us, that we will make you real to other men. It's in the precious, powerful, anointed name of Jesus Christ we pray, and we ask it all. Amen. And thank God. for who he is and what he has already done. Jesus the Christ, that's his name. Jesus the Christ, the only Son of God, the righteous one himself. And we've come tonight to lift him, to praise him, to honor him, to magnify him, for he is God all by himself. And we thank him tonight for who he is what he has already done. Why don't you put your hands together and thank God for Jesus. Thank God for Jesus. Thank God for Jesus. His name, his name is Jesus. Hallelujah to the Lamb. There is no God like our God. His name is Jesus the Christ. There is none like him. There is nobody. There is no being. There's no person like our God. His name is Jesus. Amen. And bless the name of Jesus. Let me call your, your, your attention to uh, Matthew chapter 6. We'll look at the entire chapter, chapter 6, but we will be reading from Matthew 6, verses 9 through 18. Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 18. Matthew chapter 6. Verses 9 through 18. You can also find this particular pericope in Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. We'll be looking at Matthew chapter 16. I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 18. Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 18. All the month of January, each year, we focus on prayer. We focus on the need for prayer, the importance of prayer, the power of prayer, the privilege of prayer. So tonight we want to also begin this year in Bible study talking about prayer again. You cannot get enough of prayer. Amen? Amen. You should not be able to get enough of talking to the Lord. Prayer is a dialogue. Prayer is a communication between man and God. It is a dialogue. It is a communication between man and God. And since it is a dialogue, a communication between man and God, it has to also be a communication where God talks to man. As man talks to God, God ought to be speaking to man. It is called prayer. It is communication. It is, it is prayer. The church's DNA ought to be to pray. If you cut the church, you sample the blood. The DNA ought to read prayer. According to Pastor Timothy R. Timothy Jones, in one of the authors in the key author, 
in the book, Fix My Prayer Life, that we will be looking at later on during our prayer time and our fasting time, Pastor Jones says that prayer is the DNA of the church. And then he recites a passage that says, Jesus says that my house shall be called the house of prayer. If prayer is not going on anywhere else, it ought to be going on at the church. If the people of social clubs are not praying, people of the church ought to be praying. If your fraternity, your sorority, your favorite football team is not praying, the church ought to be praying. So prayer ought to be a part of the church's DNA. Matter of fact, it ought to be a major part of the church's DNA. When you ask the church or a church member or a saved saint, a believer, what is it you do? The first thing you ought to say, I pray. We don't cuss it out. We don't fuss it out. We don't bless them out. We pray it out. Because we're the church. Digging effort, you ought to be a praying deacon. You ought to be a deacon that doesn't mind talking to God. A deacon that doesn't mind God talking to you. And when God talks to you, you ought to obey what God has said. The tragic is, the tragic is, Brother Miles, a lot of people come to the conclusion that I'm going to pray, but they already made their mind up as to what they're going to do. When you show it to them in the Word and you, they see very clearly what God says to do, and they still have to pray about it, what that means, Sister Woods, is they're not really going to pray about it. They're going to do what they want to do. Therefore, Pastor R. Timothy Jones declares that the church DNA ought to be one of prayer. If you're cut, you ought to bleed prayer. You ought to have this communication, this dialogue between you and God and this dialogue between God and you. It's a circular motion. It goes from one person to the other. From our God to us, we ought to pray. We ought to have group prayer known as corporate prayer. And we ought to have individual prayer, meaning that we ought to pray when we're not in a group. We ought to pray in silence because the God we have hears our prayer in silence. But then we ought to pray out loud because God wants others to know that we are praying and see our prayers and watch our prayers take place. Now Jesus deals with this right here in Matthew chapter 6. He talks about the fact that if you pray, you pray in secret and the God who hears in secret rewards you openly if you're in court, even if you cannot stand up and call on God, you ought to pray in secret. Because the judge's heart, the jury's hearts are in the hand of the Lord. And the Bible said that he turns the hearts of the kings like many rivers of water any way he chooses to. And so what you do, you ought to pray. Prayer should be practiced as a spiritual discipline. Pastor Jones said it ought to be a spiritual discipline. First of all, it ought to be a dialogue, not a monologue, meaning that you ought not talk to God and don't listen to God talk to you. Secondly, not only should it be a, a dialogue, it should also be uh, prayer ought to be something that, that you can really hold on to because you practice it as a spiritual discipline. It's not a tradition, but you ought to be accustomed to prayer. We begin every year talking about prayer, actually bending down and calling on the Lord in prayer. Prayer ought to be a discipline. 
a spiritual discipline. We are to, you know, I, I've come to the conclusion, if I don't wake up in the morning, early in the morning, the Bible says, seek him early in the morning. If I don't wake up early in the morning before everybody else wake up and spend some time in prayer, everybody in the world, people I haven't heard from in 30 years, they will find something for me to do before I talk to the Lord. And then once you get in that rat race, then you find yourself praying on the fly. Because people come to the conclusion all the time, I don't have to bow down and pray. And that's true. But when you spend your quality time in prayer with the Lord, the idea of buying down simply means that, God, you got my attention. God, I am consecrating on nothing but you and my intimacy with you. So first of all, prayer is a dialogue. Prayer ought to be a part of our DNA. Thirdly, prayer ought to be our spiritual discipline. And prayer brings us closer to God. One of the scriptures that... that the authors use in this first introduction part of the book is they use Psalm 16 and 11. Psalm number 16 and 11. I'll put one person on the spot. Sister Davis, give me Psalm 16 and 11. Recite Psalm 16 and 11 for me. Sister Carolyn Jean or David. Give me the first word. Psalm 16 and 11. Psalm 16... The path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, in your right hand. Okay, sing it for me. <laughs> Give me a minute. Psalm 1611. Okay, we're coming back. If you don't, if you don't know it, if you don't know it, if you can't recite it, you need to sing it for us. Psalm 1611. So he talks about the fact that I have joy in your presence. He talks about the fact that prayer ought to bring us joy. We ought to get joy in the presence of the Lord. In other words, we ought to have intimacy with the Lord. Psalm 1611. Right there in the first part of the book. Why can I put Sister Davis on the spot for this? Because she does it every Saturday. Every single Saturday. She goes and she pumps people and rock with people. You look, look at the video sometimes. Psalm 16 and 11. So the psalmist says, David is running away from Saul. Saul is throwing javelins at him, trying to take his life. David says, Lord, I'm secure in you. And he even talks about the fact that you won't even leave my soul and my body in shield. Sheol, Hades, the common grave. Psalm 1611. Come on, Sister Davis, come, come, come here quickly, please. Psalm 1611. Psalm 1611. <laughs> Put me on the spot. You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Psalm 1611. Okay, you want to demonstrate it? No. His path cycling is where we began. Psalm 1611, in, in his presence, we have joy. In our prayer time, you see, prayer brings about joy. So tell me what I've told you so far. First of all, prayer is a dialogue, communication between you and God. Number two, prayer is, DNA of the, church. is the DNA of the church. Number three. Prayer is a spiritual discipline. Number four, prayer brings us joy in the presence of God. We ought to have joy in his presence. We ought to have joy in the presence of God. In other words, prayer brings us intimacy with God. We have intimacy with God. Prayer is the believer's direct line to the heart of God. Prayer is a direct line to the heart of God. What is prayer? Prayer is a direct line to the heart of God. Okay, now why don't people pray more often? 
I oftentimes say two, the two most neglected things of the common church are prayer and evangelism. Can you agree with that? The church, the common thing of the church, prayer and evangelism are neglected. The necessities, the essentials of the church, prayer and evangelism are neglected. So number five, prayer is a direct line to God's heart, to the heart of God. Prayer is a direct line to the heart of God. Now, if you want to get God's heart, if you want to, to make sure that God hears you, you ought to pray. Number six, I'm at number six, right? Number six, prayer is the river where some die of thirst. Prayer is the river where some die of thirst. Prayer is the river where some die of thirst. Number next, seven, prayer is the river where we kneel and drink. One is negative, one is positive. Prayer is the river where some die of thirst. In other words, prayer is available to us. Prayer is all around us. Prayer is present. God is present. He wants us to pray. Prayer is nothing but a river. And we still got men, women, boys, and girls dying from thirst. And there's a river present. Pastor Crawford Pence says that prayer is a river where some die of thirst, while others kneel down and drink. Where are you? Are you the one that's dying of thirst? <laughs> or are you the one who's kneel down, kneeling down and drinking? If you're in prayer, you're the one who kneels down and drinks. If you're not in prayer, you're dying of thirst. My, my, my. That should be number eight, correct? Seven. That's called seven. There's seven? Did y'all make it seven or eight or seven and eight? Seven. Okay, let's make it number seven. Okay, number eight. Prayer is a place where burdens change shoulders. Arthur is unknown. Prayer is the place where burdens change shoulders. What is he talking about? Anybody? Why is prayer the place where burdens change shoulders? Because when you're going through stuff, you're burdened down. But when you pray about it, you give that to God, so it changes from your shoulders of burdens to God. I like that. Okay, so prayer is a place where burdens change shoulders. So when you're going through something, you are burdened down. Those burdens are upon your shoulders. But in the midst of prayer, the burden changed from your shoulders to God's pillars. Anybody else? What do y'all think that means? Anybody else that, that won't take a stab at it? Well, why do people take the bur their burden and put it on God's shoulders and take it back and put it on their shoulders? Yeah, we take it back. We put it on, 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 on our shoulders. We, we put it on God's shoulders. And then we pick it back up again. I conclude this. If we serve a God who never sleeps nor slumbers, that means that God is wide awake. That means God is up late at night. Why don't you sleep? I contend that we ought to be sleep. We ought to be resting. That's another thing that, that David talks about in and, and Psalm 16, he says, Lord, I'm going to get my rest. So prayer brings us to a place of rest. Prayer brings us to a place of rest. To answer your question why people keep picking it up, because we are living in what Charles Dickinson, 
Charles Dickens called the best of times and the worst of times. He says that we are living in the worst of times and the best of times. He says we are living in the best of times and the worst of times. What is he talking about? We're living in the best of times. What's good about what we live in, where we're living now? Anybody? What's good about where we're living now? We're living in the best of times. Can you agree with that? I can. You can? Why, why are you living in the best of times? I'm retired. <laughs> You're retired. Okay, that's one way. One way of looking at it. Now, this is the person that fought against retirement. That told the doctor where the doctor need to go. And I'm going to do this. Well, sister, you ain't going to be able to teach now. Yeah, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do this. But all of a sudden, since she's retired, she's living in the best of times. Anybody else living in the best of times? Because you don't have to get up and go to work. Okay? Now, how many people agree that we're living in the worst of times? Okay? Anybody want to elaborate on how we're living in the worst of times? The world and the way the world is with all of the shooting. They just scared to leave the house and go to the grocery store. Well, she, she, she sounds like them old right? folk, didn't she? Scared to leave the house. Well, she, I guess she is the old folk now, huh? When I go back home, I ask mama, where's this old person, this old person? And I realize I am the old person now. She says because of so many shootings and killings and that it makes you scared to move, leave the house. And corona makes you scared to leave the house. Brother Miles, why we say we're living in the worst of times? Digging out for next. They're doing what is right in their own eyes. Digging out, but why are we living in the worst of times? Because we are more and more lovers of sin. We love the creature more than the creator. We love, when we say we love the creature, we talk about human beings, usually. Now we have people that love animals more than the creator. Now we have people, not only do they love the creature more than the creator, they love the created more than the creator. Cars, houses, jewelry, those things that were created that, that don't even have blood running through their veins. Sister Betty Anderson from Indianola, Mississippi says that, that we're living in the evil days where wrongdoing has, has caught us out. <laughs> wrongdoing has taken over. We live in the worst of times because because there's no justice, because we're living in a pandemic. And none of us have been through what we're going through now in this pandemic. We read about the blue bunny plague. Our foreparents, many of them were part of the blue bunny plague. But this, what we're in now, We are in a fix now. And we are in a fix that needs to be fixed. So Sir Henry said that people are, people are calling wrong, right, and right, wrong. We're living in the worst of times. There's depression. There's alcoholism. There's drug addiction. There's suicide at an all-time high. Even rich people are killing themselves. Abuse. Our four parents used to say it like this. If we ever needed God, we sure do need him now. So will we conclude tonight that we need to be praying? James chapter 4 verse 8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. At least talk to him. At the very minimum, Talk to God. 
at the very minimum, see what God has to say about it. I remember when they promised me that I was going to be overlooked for a promotion, I would always say these words. Let's see what God has to say about it. I remember a supervisor, shift supervisor coming up to me on the night shift to talk me out of applying for an instrumentation engine technician position. They wanted me to be an operator where well, one week I'm on nights and next week I'm on days and I wanted to go to straight days. I applied and Scott Steins applied. So they sent the supervisor by and they said to me, the supervisor said to me, that the description for the job application has everything on it that applies to Scott Stein except his hair color and his eye color. You don't have a chance, so you ought to take your application out. I said then and I say now, let's see what God has to say about it. So he thought I was foolish enough to leave me alone. I had the interview. Scott Stein had the interview. I was rewarded the position because I did not take my name out. When we pray, we expect God to speak even to those who don't believe. The heart of the king is in the hand of God, and he turns it every which way he wants to, like many rivers. God chooses to. Let's look at Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Matthew begins by talking about when you pray and when you do charitable good, make sure you keep it to yourself. He says, some, uh, I think it's King James that says, when you do alms, don't tell other folk about it. Mm. New King James says, when you do charitable deeds, don't tell other people about it. He deals directly with our attitude before prayer, attitude during prayer, and attitude after prayer. Mm. He says, whatever you do, don't tell other folk. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do charitable deeds, do not sound like a trumpet. Before you are just a hypocrite. Don't sound like a trumpet in, 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 in the presence of other hypocrites. Don't stand up in the synagogue and brag about it. Don't stand in the streets and and give yourself glory or let men give you glory. Because you have your reward if you do it this way. What is he talking about? What is he talking about? You got your reward. You have your reward. If you stand and you announce it, you stand and you tell people about it. What is he saying? People will reward you. Keep it to yourself because the reward that you get from people... Temporary, short-lived. If you get your, the way he says, this is your reward, it means you got your reward from the people because you call attention to yourself. And since you got your reward from people, don't worry about getting your reward in heaven. Who you want to reward you? God or man. You want your reward from heaven, from God himself. But when you do charitable deeds, when you do arms, when you do good things for people, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Don't let other folk know that your charitable de deeds may be in secret. And the Father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. The God we serve is an all-knowing God. What, is, what does that mean? What's the word for all-knowing? Omniscient. Omniscience. He's an all-knowing God. He's omni. The word omni means all. He is all-knowing. When you have a omnidirectional microphone, that means it picks up sound from any direction. 
When you have a one direction microphone, you won't pick up the sound from all directions. When you have a one directional microphone, it picks up when you're in front of it, but it can't pick it up when you're right here. That's why it frustrates me so much when I see the choir singing like this. Or when I see the choir singing like this. Or when I see the choir singing like this. Or when I see the choir singing like this. It is a one directional microphone. You have to put your mouth about one inch to two inches at the most from the microphone. The microphone is not like God. It is a one directional, unidirectional. But when it's omnidirectional, the microphones that hang over your head are omnidirectional microphone. It's designed to pick up the whole choir. But when you sing into the mic, it, it is a one directional, unidirectional microphone. People can hear you well when you put your mouth about two inches at the most from the microphone. Thank you. People get up to pray on Sunday and they stand way over here and you can't hear them. <laughs> it's ambient sound, but when you get right to the mic, it's crystal clear. Okay. Just thought I'd give it that, that little electronic lesson there. So that's why the pastor's always saying, use the microphone. Well, pastor, I'm using the microphone. No, you're not using it right. We have an omnidirectional God. We have an omniscience, all-knowing God. He knows everything from every direction. Instruments use omnidirectional microphones. When you're sharing a microphone, it may be omnidirectional. The God we serve is all-knowing. He knows everything from every direction. He's God. So he says he hears in secret and rewards you openly. But when you pray, verse number five, but when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites, for they love praying standing in the synagogues. They love praying standing in the corners of the street. They love where men can see them pray. Now, before you get all excited, that's not talking about when you get up on Sunday to pray. I can feel it in my, in my sanctified spirit that somebody says, see that, Pastor Davis? We don't need to be getting up praying out loud. It says, whatever you do, whatever you say, assuredly I say to you, they will have their reward. Then it begins where I'm after today, tonight. Verse number six, he says, but you, when you pray, go into your room. King James says, go into your closet. And when you have shut the door, when you shut the door behind you, King James says, when you pray, go into your closet. And when you get there, shut the door behind you. He's saying, prayer is private. What number is that? Prayer is private. And when you shut the door, Prayer is personal. Prayer is private. Go into your secret closet. It's a private closet. Now is he talking about going into your closet and, and shutting the door at your, in your closed closet? That may be your prayer room. That may be your place for you to steal away. But what he's saying is when you get alone with the Lord, find your quiet place. Find, you know, at one time when I first came to Houston in 1985, I could use my car as a quiet place, but I can't do that anymore. <laughs> I, uh, what is it? Why? Why I can't use my car as a quiet place? Because of the, the road rage that's so greatly involved now. I got to watch everything. I got to pray on the fly. <laughs> Pray in the midst of it. Pray before it. Pray doing it. Pray after it. 
I saw this commercial. A woman said, God asked her, do we need Jesus to get to heaven? She said, man, you need Jesus to get to Walmart. You need Jesus to walk out the door. You need to be praying before you get to Walmart. What do you mean? Do you need Jesus to get to heaven? Yeah, you need Jesus to get to heaven. You need Jesus to go to Walmart. You need Jesus to walk out your door. In other words, you need to be praying regardless of where you go. So prayer is private. Prayer is personal. He says, go into your secret closet, and when you've gotten to that secret place, shut the door. Pray to your father who is in the secret place. Now, I told you God was omniscient, meaning he knows all. Now I'm telling you that God is omnipresent. Omni, he is all present. He's everywhere at the same time. So if you go in your, your secret place, the God that we serve is in that secret place. The same God that's walking with you into the secret place He's also the same God that's already in the secret place. So you need to find you a secret place, and God will be there with you. Ooh, good God Almighty. Look at what he said. He says, who is in the secret place? In your Father who sees in secret. He's an all-seeing God. He's an all-seeing God. He's an omniscient God. He's a, um, I just created a word. He's an omnivisional God. He is omnivisional. He's omnivisual. There it is. He's an omnivisual God. He sees in secret and will reward you openly. He's an omnivisual God. He sees in secret. And he's a rewarder and he rewards you openly. Look at God. Who wouldn't serve a God like that? Who wouldn't serve a God like the God we serve? He is an omnipresent God. Omniscient God. Omnivisual God. Then it says he rewards you openly. Guess what he is now? He's an omnipotent God. He is an all-powerful God. Omnipotent. The word is omnipotent. I mean, we just talking about prayer. He's an omnipotent God. This is the attitude we ought to pray with. We're praying to the omniscient God. We're praying to the omnipresent God. We're praying to the omnivisual God. And we are praying to the omnipotent God. The omnipotent God. Nobody can reward us openly like the God we serve. He is the omnipotent God. He is the all-powerful God. He is the all-potent God. He's the omnipotent God. Jesus said, when you pray, you ought to pray like this. Verse 7, he says, and when you pray, do not use vain repetition as heathens. First, he says, don't be like the hypocrites that want attention. Now, he says, don't be like the heathens that just repeat, recite their prayer over and over again. How many of you grew up in churches where when this deacon prays, you can say his whole prayer? Anybody? Yep. Lord, here I am again. Yeah. Bow down my face before the mother's dust. Lord, it's not my father. It's not my mother. It's me, oh God. Standing in the need of prayer. And boy, they could do it. Man. I mean, those guys could call on the Lord. Right. We have to understand that Jesus says... Don't be repetitious. The heathens do that. Don't be repetition as the heathens, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Now look at what he says. The heathens pray, 
because they want you to know they got a vocabulary. They pray where you can't pronounce the words they're praying. If you're going to pray like that, pray to yourself at the house. Pray to God by yourself. Because when you're praying and people are hearing you and people are listening to you, then you want them to have the same connection with God that you have. In other words, don't pray so long. In other words, let me just tell you, if you pray often, you won't have to pray so long. Let me just pause right here. On Sunday mornings, when you get up to do the devotions, it's not an altar prayer. Mm -hmm. We have to learn that there are prayers for different reasons and different things. Amen. If you notice, when I pray on Sunday morning before church began, I don't pray for the sick. I don't pray for the imprisoned. Mm -hmm. I don't pray that the Lord regulate my mind other than in this service. Because the devotional prayer is for this service. Teach us, Lord. Speak to us, Lord. Bless the preacher that his words will be clear. His words will be relevant. That his words will be on time. Bless the choir, Lord. Bless them that they will sing to the glory of God. Bless the people that their mind will be receptive. It's called a devotional prayer. We are devoting ourselves to you, the, you, the Lord himself, in this service. So when we do devotional prayers, we are praying to devote ourselves to God in this service. We're not praying so people can say we really prayed. We're not praying so we can use big words and practice our big words on people. We're not praying so people can see how long we can pray. We are praying to devote ourselves and call God's blessings upon this service. That's our devotional prayer. When you do an altar prayer, you're praying for whatever it, the ailments are. We've come to the altar, we're bringing our, our burdens to the Lord, and we're going to leave them at the altar. That's when you're praying for the prison. You're praying for the in prison, brother. You're praying for, for those who are sick, those who are bereaved. I told you earlier, we live in the best of times and the worst of times. Does anybody know why we stopped doing altar prayer by bringing people to the altar? New Beginning Church. Why did we stop calling people to the altar? Everybody come up to the altar. Who knows? What? Did you hear what she said? We stopped calling people to the altar and we allow them to pray while they're in their seats because people begin to steal stuff while everybody else is praying. We live in the worst of times. So suppose you didn't know why we stopped doing all the prayer like that, huh? She said, at the new beginning, church? <laughs> Sister Davis is missing right today. She's missing a $1,500 camera that her husband bought that she just had to have. That she just relished. I mean, a $1,500 camera. Brother Miles, she couldn't go another day with that. <laughs> and the case was outside when we got out of church. The camera was gone. All the pictures were gone. All the SD cards. We had just transferred from, from having uh, one of those film cameras to having an SD card. And she had to have a Nikon, you know. And it was taken during the altar prayer. So when we pray an altar prayer, we're praying for the ailments. We're praying for the conditions of the world. We're praying for what we're going through. Devotional prayer, we're praying for this service. So when you come up to pray, Sister Richard, you're praying for this service. Lord, bless in this service. Meet us here. We know you're already here. Manifest yourself in this service. That's why our devotional prayers are two, three minutes long. And it's over. We ask the Lord to bless. Bless now, Lord. We ask the Lord to receive our thanksgiving 
Lord, we thank you. We glorify you. We magnify you. We adore you. Lord, we thank you for who you are. Lord, forgive us for our sins. Lord, bless this service, that this service will glorify you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. It says, don't be like the heathens that pray with a whole lot of words. A whole lot of words and a whole lot of big words. He says, when you pray, make sure you don't pray. Sister Betty says that make sure you're not praying for a show. Verse number eight. He says, for, verse 7 says, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Verse number 8. Therefore, do not be like them. Like who? Like the hypocrites, like the heathens. Don't be like them. For our Father knows, here he is again, our all-knowing God, omniscient God. Our Father knows the things you need before you ask him. Amen. Prayer is when you communicate with God. It's a, it's a dialogue. We're praying and we're talking to God. And when we talk to God, guess what? God knows what we need. But you ought to have intimacy with him. And as you have intimacy with God, God knows what you need before you ask him. I'm just talking about the attitude of prayer. You got to have the right attitude. James says that, yeah, you prayed, but you prayed amiss because you prayed in vain, because you prayed with the wrong motives. You pray amiss. King James said you prayed amiss. New King James, New American Standard says you pray with the wrong motives. You pray with the wrong causes in mind. Some pray to be heard by men. Some pray to have big words. Some pray so people can, can ooh and ah over them. Some have a repetition of prayer. And every condition dictates the need for prayer, right? Every condition dictates how you're going to pray, right? Why would I be praying for the sick when I got a child that's strung out? I bow down to pray for the child and I get caught up with praying for something else. Are you with me? So you, you aim your prayer at God. God is the object of your prayer. You talk to God about it. Another problem that we have at the local, in the local church is that we pray so other folk can hear what other folk business is. What do I mean by that, brother, brother Alfred? What do I mean? When I say they pray so people can hear what other people business is. What, what am I talking about when people pray? And, and I'm saying they praying so they can hear what other people's business is. Mm -hmm. Telling other folks business. Hmm? Telling other folks business. They telling other people business. In their prayers. <laughs> so we pray in the church. We, we pray in the church so other folk can know other folk's business. And we call that spiritual. That's not, that's not prayer. That's, that's, that's what heathens do. So they can be heard in many words. Therefore, do not be like them. For our Father, your Father, knows the things that you need before you ask Him. Verse number 9. In this manner, therefore, pray. Pray like this. Our Father who art in heaven, or our Father in heaven, you address God as the Father, all caps, capitalized Father. Our Father in heaven. Number one, he's our Father. Number, number two, he's not just my Father. Number three, he exists in heaven. So you address him as the Father. He's the one who gives us what we need. We're addressing him as the Father. He's the, he's the founder. Every good and perfect gift comes from our Father. So when you pray, are you going to pray to somebody that will give you a serpent? Or are you going to pray for somebody who will give you meat and food for the day? Did you know that the, the Powerball tonight is over $630 million? Did anybody? I, don't, don't raise your hand. 
is over six hundred and thirty million dollars. Boy, we could do some ministry with that, couldn't we? We can do some. We can do some ministry with that. So, but we have a Father who gives us our daily bread. Therefore, we have to pray daily. Let's let's go further. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be your name. Hallowed. So here we are. We are adoring God. Prayer ought to be in admiration. Admiration. Adoration. We ought to pray and adore God. So prayer ought to be adoration. Adoration. We ought to adore God. We want to confess to him. We know you are our father. We want to confess to him. We know he's in heaven because people think their God lives around the corner from them. People think, think their God is their Joni. Their Santa Claus. People think their God is their Sancho. Ain't no sense in going home. They think their God is Jody. He says, our Father which art in heaven. So he's, he's not on earth. He's in heaven. The prayers are answered in heaven. And having said that he, you're addressing the God that's in heaven, he's also the God that's everywhere at the same time. He says, hallowed to your name. Lord, we adore you. You're at, we, we have admiration for you. Verse number 10, Matthew chapter 6, verse number 10. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, we want the atmosphere on earth that is in heaven. Your kingdom come. Wherever there's a kingdom, there must be a king. God, we admit, we acknowledge you as the king. And the king does whatever he wants to do in his kingdom. Now, Lord, we want this kingdom to be like that kingdom up there. So let your kingdom come to earth. Let your will be done on earth. Lord, this is my will. When we pray, we ought to give God our wills. Lord, this is my will. But Lord... Not my will, your will be done. Jesus says, Lord, take this cup away from me. But then he says, not my will, your will be done. So, Lord, I want your kingdom to come to planet Earth, that your will be done on planet Earth like your will is done in heaven. Who tried to threaten God's will in heaven? Who was it that tried to threaten God's will? Lucifer. Lucifer. The devil, Satan, the slick one. He, he, he launched a coup. He did a January 6th. <laughs> and I ain't talking about tomorrow. I'm not talking about a year ago. He tried a January 6th. He's going to try to steal what God had going on. He tried to shut down heaven and make the host of heaven worship him instead of worship God. The bad thing about it, Sister Davis, he was a musician. He was a choir director, Sister, Sister Richard. He was a singer. The devil. Is that why you get so much hell in, in the choir? Not at this church, huh? So, so we have, we have to understand that coups and overthrowing the, throwing the government just didn't happen in 2020. The devil been trying to do it, and he made an attempt not on mankind, but on the Almighty God, the King of the Kingdom. Talking about the election was stolen. <laughs> trying to convince folk in heaven. And guess what? The Bible says that God threw Satan down from heaven like a rocket, like an arrow, like a, like a lightning bolt. God threw him down from heaven. And guess what it says? In the host of the demons also. So everybody that, that, that tries a coup, they always got some followers. They always got somebody that's going to follow. 80 million followers? 
That's just a drop in the bucket compared to what the devil did. Verse number 11. Give us this day our daily bread. The problem is many times we start our prayer asking the Lord, give me this daily bread now. <laughs> we don't adore him. We don't, we don't confess to him. We just start saying, Lord, give me, give me, give me, and give me more. But Jesus says when you pray, you ought to adore him. You ought to have admiration for him. You ought to want his kingdom to come, his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then you ask for daily bread. Why do you think he says, give us this day our daily bread? Brother Miles, why do you say daily bread, Brother Miles? Brother Miles? God gives us what we need for that day. And also, remember, it's in the midst of the prayer, right? So we ought to be praying how many? Daily. How much? All day. Paul says to the church at Thessalonica, pray continuously. So God gives us what we need for that day. Daily bread. Verse number 12. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Now we're saying, God, when we forgive people, you forgive us. The reverse is as true. If we don't forgive people, you don't have to worry about forgiving us. Isn't that something? He says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Jesus says forgiveness is important. Just today, the lady was telling a story, and she said that she got fired from her job. And she was in the mall one day, and the CEO that fired her walked in the mall. It was early in the morning, so there wasn't a lot of people there. And so she wanted to, to tell her off, or she wanted to run away. But she walked up to the lady just like she recognized her, acting like she knew her, walked up to her and said, hello, how you doing? And the lady spoke back to her, and she didn't even remember who she was. The CEO didn't even remember who she was. She said, the young lady said, this is a prime example that people who have done us wrong have gone on to live their lives and we're still trying to hold them bondage. We're really holding ourselves in bondage. So you forgive and move on. As you forgive others, God forgives you. Give us, forgive us our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from the evil one. Deliver us from the evil one. Lead us not into temptation. The Bible is clear that God does not tempt any man, but we are led astray by our own fleshly desires. We are led astray by our own fleshly desires. He says, do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Deliver us from evil is what King James says. Deliver us from evil. If we're going to be delivered from this evil world, if we're going to be delivered from the evil circumstances, and certainly if we're going to be delivered from the evil one, then it's going to take God. So we ought to pray to God. Voting is great. Voting is good. But we ought not neglect prayer. God deliver us from the evil one. And the evil one is not the guy in the office. It is the devil himself. Finally, he says, verse 13, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. He says, God, you own the kingdom. God, you are the king. God, you can handle the evil, the evil one. God, you have the power. Check this out. God has dunamis power. 
and he has excusia power. God has the dunamis power, the dynamite power, the explosive power that will get things done. He has the authority to get it done. And he, he also has excusia power. He has the power to make sure that you understand that he's the one. Police officer walks up, it doesn't matter if she or he is 5'2", or 4'11", or 6'10". It doesn't matter how tall, how buff they are. The, the, um, the badge, the uniform says that they have the authority to get it done. But the gun, the taser, the blackjack, the handcuffs, says that he has the, the, the explosive power to get it done. Yep. So the city, the county, the state have given them both the authority and the explosive power to get it done. That's why when police officers pull over your children, you need to tell them that we ain't privileged. <laughs> I figured I'd put that out there. We are not privileged. We don't have the privilege to plan somebody else's murder and get away with it. We don't have the privilege to know you have a gun, help you buy a gun, and make sure that you don't get caught. We don't have that privilege. So when they pull you over, you got both hands on the steering wheel. After you've taken all your credentials out and laid them on the dashboard, where they can see them through the window. You got all of your credentials. Anything you think they're going to ask you, put it on the dashboard. Put both your hands. Don't get so nervous until you forget to put both your hands on the steering wheel. And if anybody's in the back seat, they got both hands on the back of the front seat. Because they have both the excusia power and the dynamite power. They have the authority to get it done and they have the explosive power to get it done. And it will not hurt to say, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, yes, sir, no, sir. So he says, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. To you, God, you deserve all the glory. Don't try to take God's glory. We're going to have to stop here tonight at verse number 13. We'll pick up uh, next week talking about fasting. For if you forgive men, Let's go to verse 15. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive your trespasses. It's all about you forgiving others and God forgiving you. I'm so glad we're on this lesson tonight. So when you get here on Sunday morning, whatever Pastor Davis has done to you or said to you or looked at you the wrong way, you know now you got to forgive. Hallelujah to the Lord. Because yep. you're, you're holding yourself hostage. The little girl said, the, the CEO didn't even know who I was. She's going on by her business. I thought she was going to remember me. She didn't even remember who I was. She fired me, but she didn't remember me. I got to forgive her because she's going on by her business. She's probably going to hire somebody else and fire them too by now. <laughs> right. Jesus says when we pray, we ought to pray like this. This is not the Lord's prayer. It is the model prayer. This is a model that Jesus has laid out for us, and we ought to follow this model. And so we have several things tonight that we found right here in this text that prayer is all about. This is the attitude in which we ought to pray. The door of the church is open. The invitation is to come to Jesus Christ to receive him as your personal Lord and Savior. The door is open because Jesus Christ is the one who gets us into the kingdom. You must believe the story that Jesus died for your sins, buried in a borrowed tomb, and rose from the dead. Just repeat after me and, and invite him into your life. Just say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. 
I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We believe that you're now born again. If you, go to, if you die, you're going to heaven when you die. If you want to, to give to the New Beginning Church, you can do so by giving, by mailing your offering to New Beginning Church, P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas. 77459. That's New Beginning Church, P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Or you can sell your money to lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Thank you so much for, for sharing with us tonight, for being a part of our Bible study. In our prayer time, we're praying for Brother Nash Carter. We're praying for Sister Helen Hannah. We're praying for COVID patients as well as those who are sick and bereaved. We're lifting them in prayer. Father God, we thank you now. We bless your name. We thank you, Father, for another privilege. Lord, we glorify you. We magnify you. We thank you for who you are. We come now asking you to forgive us for our sins. We pray for Nash Carter. We pray that you touch and heal his body. As only you can. We know you as the great physician. You're the one who heals and makes us whole. We pray for Sister Helen Hannah. We pray that you heal her and touch her. We know you as Jehovah Rophi. You're the God who heals us. We pray that you bless her in the name of Jesus. We pray for sick patients from COVID-19. We pray for those who are sick all over this world. We ask you to raise them up. Heal and touch their bodies. Bless the bereaved families, Father God, that they will be able to move forward and they will be able to trust you and to be blessed by you. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, unto him the only wise and only true God, be power, glory, and dominion until we meet again, let us sing together. Amen, amen, and amen. We are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus says, in I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John 12 and 32. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer.